All right, trying to pick up where we left off. We were, sorry, interrupted right in the middle of my sentence uh, before the last video cut off. So I was saying that um, unlike Charlotte Perkins Gilman's doctor, um, S. Weir Mitchell, you remember him, um, he was the one who had inspired his treatment, the rest cure, had inspired Gilman to write her story, The Yellow Wallpaper. So Kate's doctor prescribed the opposite treatment for Kate when she was suffering from grief uh, and depression um, over her husband and mother's death. Um, her longtime family friend was her doctor also, and his name is Frederick Kolbenheyer. So this is the doctor who prescribed the cure for her. And for her, her cure was uh, for her symptoms of depression and grief. Um, her cure was to read and write as much as possible to assuage the abounding grief she felt after having lost her father and then her half-brother, he, her beloved great-grandmother, her husband, and now, most recently, her mother. She had a lot of losses, a lot, a lot of tragedy, um, and so she was counseled by her doctor to read and write. Now, Colvin Hire was an agnostic, um, which means somebody who who doesn't really know whether God exists, says maybe God exists, maybe God doesn't exist, I'm not sure. So um, he actually had Kate read Charles Darwin and Thomas Huxley and other writers who seemed to challenge traditional Christianity. Now, I wouldn't say that Charles Darwin challenged Christianity per se, um, because he actually talks about God in his writings. However, a lot of people have taken Darwin's um, theories on uh, the survival of the fittest uh, and the... Um, and evolution and things like that that have come from his research, they have used that to turn on its head the argument that there is a creator, that God created things and said, oh, look, since we evolved, God didn't create things. However, I mean, the two are not, of course, mutually exclusive. You could believe that God created things through evolution, that that was the way he created things. Or, you know, you could say there's not a creator. So, you know, that argument can go either way, right? Uh, it's kind of like, you would say an agnostic argument, just like Colvin Hires, where, you know, you could say there could have been a God, there might not have been a God based on evolution, right? It, it could go either way. So anyway, the, the anthology points out that through such study, she virtually renounced most of her Catholicism. So by reading authors like Darwin and Huxley and others. Um, Kate also read regionalist fiction writers like Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, who, of course, we studied um, not too long ago. She wrote The Revolt of Mother, that really fun story, if you recall. Um, and she also wrote, uh, read other authors that were regionalists like Sarah Orne Jewett. Um, all right. Kate read French realist writer Guy de Maupassant, whose writing struck a special chord with Kate. About him, she wrote, quote, this is Kate's quote herself, I read his stories, in other words, I read Maupassant's, back to Kate's quote, I read his stories and marveled at them. Here was life, not fiction. For where were the plots, the old-fashioned mechanism and stage trapping that, in a vague, un unthinkable way, I had fancied were essential to the art of story making. Here was a man who had escaped from tradition and authority who had entered into himself and looked out upon life through his own being and with his own eyes, and who in a direct and simple way told us what he saw, unquote. So that's Kate's quote about Guy de Maupassant's writings. He wrote a lot of short stories, and she thought they were so real seeming that she felt as if she was just looking into somebody's life. You know, this is their life, you know, unfiltered through the craft of storytelling. She thought it's just, you don't have to have plots. These are observations about human life and human characteristics. So in the footsteps of these and other writers, Kate published her first poem in 1889. Her literary career took off from there. Her realist Louisiana regionalist writings with highly individualized female characters often at the heart of these writings, quickly found an audience. 
Kate's short stories and poems were published in such notable magazines as Vogue. Yeah, Vogue. We still have Vogue today, right? And Atlantic Monthly, also still a publication of today. She was writing in the 1800s. But those not those those magazines have been long, around that long that they actually published her writings way back when. Um, she became a well-known author of magazine fiction uh, in these publications and others, um, with her Creole, Cajun, and African American characters, among others, from Louisiana. Her two acclaimed short story collections, Bayou Folk, published in 1894, and A Night in Acadie, published in 1897. Um, both of those short story collections contain many of her stories. 26 of Kate's stories were actually children's stories published in such notable family magazines as The Youth's Companion. Kate even wrote two novels. Well, actually she wrote three, but the first of her no novels, At Fault, she published herself. And the second novel, Young Dr. Goss, she destroyed because she could not find a publisher for it. Kate's third novel, The Awakening, was, however, published, but was met with much criticism. So when I say she wrote two novels, she wrote those first, she wrote At Fault and Young Dr. Goss first. She destroyed Young Dr. Goss, but she published At Fault. The third novel she wrote, The Awakening, was published, but again, it was not as favorably received by the critic, critics as her first novel, At Fault. The novel was upbraided and condemned by critic and reader alike. For its immoral themes, people said, and brash allusions to sexuality. So it was a little too um, ahead of itself for its time, at least for, for its time coming from a female author. Because, uh, you know, you have Madame Bovary written by Flaubert in France at the time and deals with similar themes. And, of course, there's A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen dealing with similar themes. Now, um, Anna Karenina also was written during that time period. Um, and that was, you know, an, a Russian novel. And um, so these novels were were um, hailed with different varying levels of reception, but unfortunately Kate Chopin's was the worst out of all of those. Um, her novel uh, was, was, you know, kind of fell into obscurity after this time because of how much it was demonized by the critics and readers for its immoral themes and, and um, allusions to possible sexuality of its main character. Uh, Kate wrote another such story that same year called The Storm, but did not even attempt to publish it because of the story's, I would say, more explicit sexual content, but the, it's not really explicit by what we would say of today's standards. It was more overtly symbolically sexual is what I would say. Um, that story is published now, but it wasn't um, during her lifetime. Kate tried to defend her book against all the naysayers, and, and she said, quote, this is her quote, I never dreamed of Mrs. Pontellier making such a mess of things and working at her own damnation as she did, unquote. Um, of course, she's not damned in the book, but damned, in, in other words, in public opinion, uh, and made a mess of her book being, being um, able to be circulated for some time. But Kate's defense was to no avail, as the critics continued to attack the novel as not a healthy book, quote, unquote, quote, not a healthy book, unquote, which, quote, leaves one sick of human nature, unquote, and whose, quote, story can hardly be described in language fit for publication, unquote. Those are all quotes that come directly out of our anthology. Uh, and they're found in the Kate Chopin uh, biography section of that book. The book was even, some say, banned in the libraries of her hometown, St. Louis. Although some research say they couldn't, they, some pieces of research, if you read them, say they couldn't find evidence of that. And others say they do. Anyway, that's reported in our anthology. Can you imagine being an author and you're, you're that famous and you're banned in the library of your hometown? Um, not sure if that's true or not, but that is the... Uh, the report. 
Unfortunately, this public skewering seemed to discourage Kate, who wrote only a few more short stories before she died suddenly from a brain hemorrhage only five years after she published The Awakening. So she, she died in 1904. Um, so that was at that age of 54. She had published The Awakening in 1899 at the age of 49. She, she earned hardly any royalties from this critically penned novel that fell into basic oblivion until basically the 1960s brought it back to scholarly attention from which the novel's new life sprang from it from which it's new awakening uh the awakening now is heralded as an important proto-feminist novel for its lyrical realist regionalism and for the awakening of its new of its character and the Pontellier into the new women of transitional turn of the century literature. Quite, um, quite a revolutionary woman for its times. Um, the novel is taught in high schools and colleges alike the world over now. So I uh, welcome you to a reading of Kate Chopin's life and times in our anthology and of the writing of hers that we read this week. You would enjoy it. It's a great piece of literature. Thank you.